Hello everyone, welcome back to GGN. Uh, in this first video we are talking about uh, basically Syria and how it's escalating. And um, uh, something I'm seeing that's uh, forming is these partnerships or these new alliances in the Middle East. I don't know if it's all just show. Um, I don't know if the big plan of things is to destroy the state of Israel, if that's actually part of it. Um, the powers that be created Israel after World War II. Um, they needed all, they needed people to to emigrate there to create their their Zionist state, and that's what uh, the whole thing in Germany was about was to get the Jews to go somewhere else and create their own state, whether they wanted to or not. They get paid and everything, and I. I'm actually starting to wonder if the whole thing here that's building is they're going to actually, they created the state of Israel and now they're going to destroy it. So, you know, I'm not saying that if it's a good thing, a great thing, or a bad thing. I just, it just seems like everything goes according to a script, like we were talking about, like a movie in the last video. So you have Egypt now. It's just like Turkey, you know, it's like, you know, Muslim Brotherhood, Turkey, you know, it's kind of like two faced. They say things about Israel to appease their people, and then at the same time, they just, totally pro-West, right? So, Egypt opposes foreign military intervention in Syria. We are against any military intervention on Syrian soil and in any shape or form, said uh, Morzai, an Egyptian capital. And this is followed by Russia. Remember what I was saying, a lot of talk and you don't see a lot of action, but it says here, who knows, maybe they are, right? Maybe they're supplying uh, Syria with uh, with some intelligence and because uh, you know you know they have good satellite uh, intelligence Russia not to end military presence in Syria says army chief so it says uh, here that on Tuesday he rejected the reports that Moscow was in the process of evacuating its naval base in Syria and pulling out its high-ranking military personnel well he basically responded by saying why are you so worried about Syria all the plans that we have in place are working and no one is running away from there and they do have a base in TARDIS, or whatever it's called, and they do have these Spetsnyats uh, soldiers here, special forces. I wish Putin would just send in the Spetsnyats and crush these filthy rebels once and for all. Uh, moving on here, we have this. Syrian crisis is a proxy war against Russia. And I, I never thought about this. I thought about Syria being a proxy war against Iran. Uh, but it says here, during the Cold War, Moscow constructed a solid relationship with many countries of the Arab and Muslim world that became its allies. However, Saudi Arabia and some other U.S.-backed Arab regimes launched a global jihad campaign in the 1980s. Of course, this was headed up by who? By Zygbrig Brzezinski, right? Against the Soviet Union, which had sent troops to Afghanistan to prevent the fall of the communist regime to the Islamist insurgents. At the same time, they conducted a strong propaganda campaign to persuade Muslims that the Russians were actually an enemy of Islam. At the end of the Soviet Union, the U.S. invaded Iraq with a false pretext on weapons of mass destruction like they're trying to do with um, Syria, and I think they even tried it with Libya. It says the non-existent weapons of mass destruction, it says here, the Iraq war meant for Russia the loss of another ally and further reduction of its influence in the Arab and Muslim world. But since then, Russia has worked to reverse this trend and launch a diplomatic offensive in the Arab world in the end of the 2000s. They offered Syria and Egypt nuclear power stations and re-established a naval presence at the Syrian port of Tardis. It also started relations with Hamas, the Palestinian Islamist movement ruling the Gaza Strip. They also began to cooperate in different fields of energy, defense, trade, and so on with Egypt, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. The, uh, this alarmed the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, which understood that if Russia expanded its relations with all these countries, the Middle East would acquire a totally different appearance. So here you go. This is why they sought to further reduce the Russian presence in the region by toppling two regimes that had traditionally been allies and trading partners of Russia, Libya and Syria. Now this is important because I'm going to get into this towards the later part of this video. The jihadist war uh, in Syria and the north of Caucasus. It says here, apart from the role in the Middle East, Russia fears that the victory of Saudi and Qatari-sponsored jihadist groups in Syria could also have a negative impact on the situation in Russia's North Caucasus, where the Wahhabi insurgency is widespread, especially in regions of Chechnya and I think it's Dagestan. I've been covering this recently with these uh, attacks in that area. It says actually the insurgency in the north of the Caucasus has been funded by Saudi private organizations and individuals. At the same time, Russia sees Iran and Syria as two bulwarks to spread the extremists of uh, 
Wahhabism into Russia's North Caucasus. And finishing up, it's noteworthy to point out that Syria has an important Chechen community with links to the North Caucasus, but this community has never given problems to Moscow. However, this could change if rebels topple Assad's government. This could then become a haven for anti-Russian activities and a source of funding and support for terrorism in the Russian territory. So we are talking about Afghanistan and why the U.S. and the West went in there. It had to do with Russia and uh, using their Muslim extremists uh, uh, that they created there. It says U.S. envisions long stay in Afghanistan through a pact, so they don't have any plan to actually leave there, which I think most of us are aware of. But that's probably why they went there. It says here, an increasingly Islamist region, Israel, may be headed for war. So Israeli Defense Force Intelligence Chief warns that they have been dealing with a series of crises, regional and internal, that increases the volatility of all players. In the coming year, the state of Israel will come up against an unstable, increasingly Islamist region that has been dealing with a series of crises, engineered by the West, of course, says that increases the volatility of all of the players that could lead, without prior warning, to conflagrations. And the Muppets TV character urges Israelis to prepare for strike on Iran. It's interesting. Remember the Muppets owner in that? They were the, actually the ones, the first ones that uh, carried out that ban uh, against Chick Fil A. And then I remember I tied it with uh, I tied it with uh, Jason Alexander. And who knows if the whole thing was just a, a Zionist uh, uh, propaganda tool? Because after they came out with it, that uh, uh, protest against Chick Fil A, everybody just followed suit. It says a new emergency pamphlet. And Israel instructs residents to prepare for the worst if Tel Aviv conducts a military strike on Iran. But uh, the face of, on the brochure isn't the country's president or prime minister. It's a Muppet. It says it's Israel's co-production of the long-running America's children program, Sesame Street. The booklet issued by Israeli military instructs the Israelis how to react if their nation's government launches a war against Iran. They say that once air raid sirens sound, residents of the Jewish state would half between 30 seconds and three minutes to find cover before rockets hit the air area. Something I found interesting was this. Uh, it says here they propose separate shelters for Africans in Israel. And the meeting uh, it says here in meeting with home front defense minister officials say separate bomb shelters would solve issues of scarcity and integration. They said here there would be problems of integration because of mental and cultural differences between them and Israelis. There are many problems. People worry that the Africans would bother them or, God forbid, rape one of their daughters. And let's not forget just recently Israel was actually holding an exercise of being attacked by chemical weapons. So they're definitely preparing for something. And you have Iran-Egypt cooperation can end Syria crisis, says Hezbollah leader. So remember this, Egypt opposes foreign military intervention in Syria. And now Iran-Egypt cooperation can end Syrian crisis, says this Hezbollah leader. Says the American administration and some of their allies in the region, unfortunately, instead of taking the responsibility in order to solve the problem in Syria, are taking part in it. He says contributing to the fight and playing a very dirty game. So the Hezbollah official referred to the presence of the Egyptian president in the ongoing non-aligned movements of men in Tehran as a positive indication that their coordination and cooperation will put an end to the Syrian conflict. Then I caught this thing right here, putting it all together, this kind of, you know, little puzzle pieces. Egypt wouldn't fire on Iran ship. U.S. It says here, Egypt's Navy refused a U.S. request to fire on an Iranian weapons ship heading for violence torn Syria through the Suez Canal. The Egypt Independent had a similar report saying it was told by uh, Mamish, the Navy refused a United States request to strike the Iranian ship. Kind of what we were just talking about, right? One of these comments, this is an American mind. I don't know if it's that or just a globalist, divide and conquer, or Zionist thing or what. It says it's a, a, a basically a tactic that's set to kill Muslims through Muslims. And remember just recently in Egypt, in the Sinai Peninsula, you had what? Uh, you had some, some stuff popping off there. It says here, Israel's first drone strike inside Egyptian territory kills Sinai Bedouin. Because if I remember correctly, uh, there was basically Egyptians were attacked. And they said that they there was no evidence of who the attackers were. Meaning that this could possibly be a false flag. Which allows for what? Israeli expansion. It says here, uh, they wrote a week ago that given Barack Obama's expansive interpretation of U.S. interests, which involves massive drone attacks against targets in multiple Middle Eastern and African countries, 
that it was only a matter of time before Israel did the same, and now it has. So apparently this Bedouin was riding his motorcycle in the desert, and Israel characterized him as a follower of global jihad. His sin was supposedly involved in a missile attack against uh, Eliot, and it says last year, in which no one was hurt or injured. It says here the IDF uh, said that uh, no one would shed a tear for his death. The in the Israeli front, reconnaissance planes violate Lebanese airspace. Four Israeli warplanes and four, basically probably drones, violated their airspace on Monday, they said in a statement. Israel repeatedly violates Lebanon's airspace in contravention of UN Security Council Resolution 1701. So where's Ban Kai Moon? Where is he? Where are you, Ban? It says here, media, the United States will give Azerbaijan the northern area of Iran in exchange for participation in war. So you got, yeah, Turkey over here, uh, Syria, you know, over there, uh, Azerbaijan over here, and Iran right here. An editor's note, which is worth noting, it says here, there is a serious case of entangled alliances carving up Iran to win the war. What about the Kurds and, it says here, Nagorno and Karabakh conflict with Armenia? Neither Syria nor Iran is worth all this trouble. A nuclear arms race is already beginning in the Middle East, regardless of if Iran develops nukes or not. And it seems that Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, and other nations would rather spend their oil profits on hardware, talking about nuclear weapons, which they are doing, than to rely on the United States. Any military can have its strength diffused when their focus is too expansive. Their hands are in far too many pies. Israel signs a $1.6 billion arms deal with Azerbaijan. So I only included this because of this uh, article up here that the uh, United States will give Azerbaijan the northern area of Iran in exchange for its participation in the Iranian war. And, you know, you have Israel basically signing a billion-dollar arms deal with them. And uh, what they do? Well, this is back in March. Iran Azerbaijan try to soothe tensions after Israeli weapons ties. So there's ban. Ban to Iran. It says here, prove your nuclear program is peaceful. The U.N. chief in Tehran calls on states to stop supplying arms to the conflict in Syria. What states? You know, it's like uh, the United Nations observers had to leave because they kept getting killed by these, quote, uh, 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 terrorists or rebels, whatever, that are being supplied by the West. Why doesn't he call them out? No, he's rather be in Iran uh, basically bullying them about human rights and about their nuclear program. So, well, well, what about Israel, right? What about them? Israel and weapons of mass destruction widely believe that possessed the weapons of mass destruction and one of the four nuclear armed countries not recognized as a nuclear weapon state by the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So, yeah, basically it says here they have undeclared chemical warfare capabilities and an offensive biological warfare program. Officially, Israel neither confirms nor denies uh, possessing nuclear weapons. And so Israel is angered over the IAEA vote on nuclear arsenal says they become infuriated by a fresh initiative of Arab member states of the IAEA, which seeks to launch a global campaign to slam Israel's possession of nuclear stock. So Israel thwarts all initiatives to free the region of Middle East of weapons of mass destruction, and in particular of nuclear weapons. The initiative is widely expected to be ratified and enjoy support of Muslim countries as well as other states critical of Israel's stance on Palestine. Israel's ambassador said Arab nations have no moral right to point fingers and if just a quick history, since Israel began building its Daimona plutonium uranium processing facility in the desert in 1958, it's believed to have hundreds of nuclear warheads. But Iran is being told by the United Nations to prove your nuclear program is peaceful. UN chief hits host Iran over human rights. So he's in Iran to, uh, f for the non-aligned movement gathering, urges Iran to cooperate with the United Nations to remedy human rights abuses. Well, what the fuck is going on in Syria there, Ban? You're missing the ball. Israeli judge Rachel Corey brought death upon herself. So, as expected, Israeli judges reject a lawsuit brought by the parents of this Rachel Corey against Israeli military for crushing her to death with a bulldozer in 2003. In fact, they said she brought it upon herself and the military wasn't responsible for crushing her. So, yeah, Zionist controlled media hides Israeli crimes. Such as a recent shooting, Israeli forces shoot critically wound a Gaza woman. 42 year old woman was working together with Palestinian farmers. And more news from the 28th, West Bank cars torch in suspected hate crime. Vandals believed to be Jewish extremists set light to three cars in the village on the West Bank. Human rights. Israel indicts Jewish teenagers over attack on Arab. Nine Jewish teenagers indicted on Tuesday over a ferocious assault that nearly killed a young Arab in Jerusalem, an alleged hate crime. 
and we'll have to roll this into a third video but talking about you know two-face or what's really going on here it says here turkey excuses israel of exploiting syrian civil war to advance settlements israeli expansion which they are doing this is ggm join me in part three thanks